What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another episode of Blood, Sweat and Tears. You had the title of the video correctly. Today, I'm going to be doing a quick summary of every single Fazbear Frights story that we have been given so far, and this is updated all the way to the Puppet Carver book. Now, I'm not going to be doing uh, the Stitch Race stories today. I'm actually going to be doing that in a separate video, and I'm making this video so that we're all on the same page on all of the stories, for a future video with a lot of lore relevance. So uh, all I'm going to say is make sure that you subscribe for that. Uh, I just surpassed 10,000 subscribers, it's absolutely mind-blowing. So uh, 20k? <laughs> Let's get straight into these summaries, I'm sure you cannot wait any longer. Book number one is called Into the Pit and it begins with the story Into the Pit. <laughs> In this story, Oswald is a school kid on his summer break and his life is going downhill as a result of his friend leaving town and the mill closing, which means his dad has to get another job. Therefore, he spends his summer days alone in the library and a rebranded, abandoned Freddy's called Jeff's Pizza. And at Jeff's Pizza, there is a ball pit, uh, which actually takes him 30 years back in time to the year 1985. Back in time, however, weird stuff happens, like when Oswald's pockets fill up with loads of Faz tokens randomly. There's also a creepy man in a Spring Bonnie costume that only he can see. One day he goes back into the ball pit uh, to hear screaming, and it turns out that Spring Bonnie had killed six kids in the party room and tries to kill Oswald as well. He runs back out of the ball pit uh, but his dad gets pulled in by Spring Bonnie uh, and then the bunny comes back and everybody sees him as his dad and it, which is weird, it's, it's confusing. When Oswald goes back uh, to the bull pit he finds his dad's body when Spring Bonnie attacks oh no and accidentally hangs himself on rope above the pit. Uh, his dad has no memory of anything and Oswald has a huge bite mark on his arm. That's the end. Um, this story is very interesting but confusing and it's, re it's really difficult to tell whether or not time travel is actually real or if it's simply an illusion. Speaking of illusion, the next story is to be beautiful and it involves Sarah who, you guessed it, wishes to be beautiful. Her social life is miserable as she's ugly, uh, she can't get with her crush, she can't be on the table with the popular girls, etc, etc. One day after school, she walks past a junkyard and finds a robot called Eleanor, uh, who she takes home and cleans up. To thank Sarah for helping her, Eleanor grants her wish to be beautiful and hands her a heart-shaped pendant. Okay, remember, th this, this is important. She is told never to take it off and Eleanor sings her uh, to sleep every night. She finds that every day she is more and more beautiful uh, and she gets a date with her crush and she gets to sit with all the popular girls at school. One night she has a nightmare about Eleanor and wakes up to see her standing over her bed. She directs her to go to the corner of the room. The corner? <laughs> uh, and the next day she trips at school and the heart-shaped necklace falls off. She starts shaking and hears everybody screaming as Sarah is revealed to be a pile of scrap metal, with her real body parts found in a black bag in her garage. Ah! <laughs> Every night Eleanor had been performing surgery on Sarah and replacing her body parts with junk. My... Every Tuesday for me. We see Eleanor with the necklace transform into the original Sarah and run away from the house. One of my favourite stories ever. Seriously, it's so horrifying and so gruesome, I love it. If you thought that that was a weird way to die though, let's discuss the many ways to die in this story. And no, I'm not talking about dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Count the Ways is a story that alternates between two different times, but I'm going to summarise this all in chronological order of events, just so that you know. Millie is a goth girl uh, with no friends until she meets Dylan, who is a goth kid as well. She has a crush on him until he until she catches him kissing another girl, and she accuses him of cheating, to which he said that they were only friends. That's right, my friends, the Ozone is becoming the friend zone. 
At her family Christmas party, everyone is over and Millie finds it all sickening. Uh, so she tries to find a hiding place where they won't find her. Because Millie is a goth girl and goth girls don't do Christmas. She finds a deactivated Funtime Freddy in her granddad's workshop, which she climbs into and falls asleep in. And when she wakes up, Freddy's eyes are looking down on her and he tells her that he's going to kill her but she has to choose which way to die. Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Millie eventually picks decapitation, uh, hoping that she can dodge the blade. But the story ends with the blade uh, slicing through the carroty. That's right, we got an ambiguous ending. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad, it's ambiguous. We don't know whether or not she died. Anyway, fun fact, this story's title actually comes from an Elizabeth Barrett Browning poem called How Do I Love Thee? Uh, where the first line is, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Anyway, that was the first book where desire for things actually led to death. The second book is called Fetch, starting off with Fetch. Uh, which is about Greg and his friends who break into an abandoned Freddy's containing a dog animatronic that can connect to phones called Fetch. At school, Greg and his crush get given an assignment together on REGs, and that's Random Event Generators, which is what Fetch is revealed to be. He gets texts from Fetch, uh, who knows what he is doing all the time, and when he goes home, he gets bitten by the neighbor's dog, which is killed by Fetch the next day. Greg wants more money uh, for his experiments, so he texts his uncle for his magic finger that apparently is a lucky charm, and then Fetch brings his uncle's finger to the doorstep. <laughs> so Greg tries to destroy the animatronic. The next day, he gets told that his crush is looking for him, and when Fetch texts Greg that it's going to retrieve her, he tries to tell his crush but gets in trouble with the police. When he gets home for a shower, he finds the crush's body dead in his bathroom and Fetch texts him, see you. This is an important but crazy story from start to finish. But if you want a story with a crazier ending, look no further than the next story. Lonely Freddy, a story about Alec who is a bully to his little sister Hazel. Please hold back on all of the Michael Afton parallels already. Hazel's birthday is at Freddy's and together the siblings decide to annoy their parents by swapping roles. At the party, Alec decides to expose her for the brat that she really is and takes out the tickets to win the prize for the game that she wanted to play. However, he misses a ticket and the two fight, uh, causing Alec to damage the prize. He runs away and explores the pizzeria to find a room with a lonely Freddy toy. Freddy asks him questions uh, that get more and more disturbing. Then Alec starts to lose feeling of his own body. It turns out that he and the Freddy had body swapped, which is why kids could grab him and throw him on the ground. He got puked on by a child, then before getting taken away, saw a fake Alec having a pleasant conversation with his family. An employee throws him in a dumpster with other Lonely Freddies, all screaming with souls trapped inside of them too. Oh, that, that's a good story. It's a good one. Th that, that ending is kind of insane, but it's also weird because it's another body swap story like the second story in the first book. Um, anyway, speaking of weird, do you like the idea of a plush trap with human teeth? In Out of Stock, Oscar wants a plush trap chaser, which moves in darkness and freezes in light. One day, it's on sale, but when he gets to the shop, they had all already sold out. He overhears employees talking about a realistic plush trap that they won't be able to sell, uh, so Oscar sneaks and grabs it with his friends. When they unbox it, it has realistic eyes and yellow human teeth, <laughs> and they can't figure out how to turn it on. A few days later, they find out how to charge it, uh, then a storm makes the lights go out. They go to grab flashlights to find the plush trap chasing them. Remembering that it gets deactivated by light, they shine their lights 
and stop it in its path. Very smart, big brain. They have the idea to run all the way to the train station where they lead the plush track to the tracks and stop it for the train to drive straight into it. When they look at what was left, they see a mangled jaw and human eyes. Then they go home with a happy little ending. Now it might just be me who believes this, but are we sure that this isn't the spring trap from In The Flesh? I guess that doesn't make much sense really, I don't know. Anyway, we'll get there soon. Speaking of which, that is the second book in this in this massive marathon. All stories revolving around kids wanting control over something in their lives. Let's move swiftly onto book number three. 1.35am shows Delilah who works at a diner. That rhymes. That is kind of harder to say than you think it is. Delilah who works at a diner. She goes to a garage sale when she wakes up late and finds an Ella doll that looks like the child she wishes to have and doubles as an alarm clock. Brilliant. You, you have a, a child that you want and a, an alarm clock. Setting an alarm for 1.35 p.m. Delilah takes a nap before work in the evening. Uh, the alarm didn't work so she threw the doll out. The next few nights, she wakes up at 1.35 a.m. on the dot uh, and hears whispering, window tapping, something under the bed and gets extreme paranoia. After not being able to find Ella, she drives out of town thinking she wouldn't be followed but continues to get tormented. She then runs to a construction site and hides deep inside of a vent to the point where she is completely stuck and relaxes knowing that Ella will never bother her again. That's a strange ending. It's like me jumping into a volcano knowing that I'll never have to touch water again. You may be asking, why 1.35 am? <laughs> well, in the novel trilogy, Charlie's birthday is actually the 13th of May. One, one, three, five. A lot of you are gonna hate me for that because it's the wrong way for dates, but uh, let's just move on so that we don't cause an argument. Root for One More is one of my favourites. Stanley works in an underground facility, being told not to let anything out. On night one, he sleeps until he is greeted by a mini reader, which can say small phrases. He goes back to sleep for a nightmare about his ex-girlfriend on a date with another guy, whose spaghetti turns to worms and wakes up with a swollen arm and a sore throat. The next night, he naps, wakes up to another mini arena, then has another nightmare where he's in a taxi late to work, but the taxi driver is Funtime Foxy who attacks him. His other arm becomes swollen and his sore throat worsens. You can see where this is going. On the third night, the same thing happens, uh, but the nightmare is about him at work in the dark with an attacking Funtime Freddy. His legs get swollen and he goes to a nurse who finds blood on the back of his throat. Stanley goes back to work the next night and writes an apology to his ex-girlfriend thinking that he is going to die. Again, he wakes up to a mini arena, but then realizes that each mini arena was different. In his nightmare, he's at the dentist with Ballora as the nurse, and he awakes to find the mini arena climbing into his mouth. The mini arena says, Isn't there room for one more? I don't think they said it like that. Isn't there room for one more? Before rummaging down his throat as he screams to his death. This is why it's one of my favorite stories. It's, it's so good, it's so good, I love it. But let's get into probably what was a fan favorite from this book. The New Kid is about Kelsey, a popular new kid uh, who joins Devon and Mick who are lonely nerds, hashtag relatable. Devon is actually surprised that a popular kid had joined the duo, but at the same time, he's upset about how perfect Kelsey is in every single way because his crush likes Kelsey more. Now these guys like looking for places they can use as like a clubhouse um, and Devon takes these guys to an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's pizza. They explore and find an old golden Freddy suit. Devon encourages Kelsey to put it on and he starts to dance which triggers all the spring locks. He dies in the spring lock suit and Devon begs that Mick doesn't tell anyone. They run away 
hoping one day he'll turn up to school alive, but there was no sign of him. Devin goes back to the pizzeria to find Kelsey is no longer in the suit. He takes a closer look and sees that there's a black curly haired boy in the suit instead. He gets his hand trapped uh, and supposedly dies from blood loss or whatever. Now you'd think that that's the end of the story, but strangely we see a scene where Kelsey joins a new school, finds a couple of kids and asks them if there's any cool places to hang out. I know, it's a bittersweet ending, but it also seems very significant to the lore in some way. I mean, for one, we do have the most significant animatronic, I would say, Golden Freddy, so that's one thing. Anyway, that's the end of book three. Stories birthed from the pain of loneliness. Now let's take one step closer uh, to the end of the series. That's right, the fourth book is called Step Closer, and the story involves Pete, who has to look after his brother Chuck as a result of his parents' divorce. Pete tries to scare Chuck at Freddy's, uh, in the maintenance room with Foxy, but his shirt gets caught and Foxy comes out to him singing, You can be a pirate, but first you'll have to lose an eye and an arm. <laughs> that was pretty good. Over the next few days, multiple sharp objects seem to fly towards Pete's arm and his eye. A scalpel, a knife, a buzzsaw, a fishing hook. He also has nightmares about Foxy taking out his eye and his arm. Uh, one day he's at homecoming carnival and more army eye stuff happens. Then he realises that it will only stop if he goes to confront and avenge Foxy at Freddy's. On his way to Freddy's, he gets hit and killed by a truck. At the end of the story, we see Pete conscious but unable to move his body. Watch as his body gets taken apart as an organ donor. One of the reasons I love this story is because to me it was the evidence that I needed for Michael Afton to be the older brother. There's a lot of evidence for it, even the small things like the fact that he was an organ donor. I may have a whole video covering this story uh, in more depth in the near future. Speaking of near, sorry that, <laughs> that was a very bad tangent. <laughs> The next story is called Dance With Me. Uh, it's about Casey. That's right, Casey, not Kelsey. Don't get them mixed up. So Casey and her pals are thieves and she steals a woman's purse at Circus Baby's Pizza World. Inside, there's a pair of children's glasses that say, put on the glasses and Ballora will dance for you. She puts the glasses on and sure enough, a holographic Ballora image starts dancing. She finds out a few things about this Ballora. Firstly, it seems to be getting closer and closer to Kelsey. I said Kelsey. Casey. <laughs> Secondly, it wasn't just a hologram as it could affect the environment around it. And finally, Casey was the only one who could see the Ballora. This gets her into an argument with her friends, leading to her running away from her problems. She gets a job at a diner but keeps stealing. She then runs to another place and tries to steal a dress for a job interview, but gets caught. Nothing bad happens to her, however she realises she should actually give the glasses back to the original owner to make Ballora go away. Therefore, she goes to the address of the woman that she stole from and gives the child her glasses back just as Ballora gets to her and the kid starts to dance. Now it's unclear here whether this means that the child was possessed by Ballora or if she just wanted to dance with the Ballora. Uh, but a lot of people don't like this story and I don't really know why. Uh, I, I personally quite liked it. Speaking of controversial opinions, uh, I actually didn't enjoy the story as much as uh, the others did, but this is coming home uh, and it's a bit of a strange story As if the others aren't. In this one we do follow Susie, but she has a different hair color uh, To the one in the games, so don't get too excited. Now a year ago from the present Susie was murdered uh, Breaking up her entire family during the daytime Susie lives in the house as an invisible spirit however at 12 a.m. Chica comes to her house to take her soul away, making her lose consciousness until she wakes up in the house again the next morning. This is very complicated. Outside the house there is a tree called Oliver, and when all of his leaves fall, 
Susie will no longer be able to see her family again. With one day left, Susie communicates with her sister Samantha through drawings that she must find the doll that the sisters fought over. As Chica enters and hunts Samantha, she finds the doll in her father's secret office and comes out to see Chica and Susie leaving. Uh, she shouts for them to stop and Susie appears before Samantha to say their last goodbyes. Uh, she watches the two disappear and is happy knowing that Susie will be okay. The reason I don't really like the story is because I don't totally get it. Like, what does the tree have to do with anything? Why does Chica come to the house? Why does Samantha have to find the doll? Uh, if any of you guys can let me know in the comments, that would be fantastic. So that's the fourth book, uh, all about dealing with empty feelings in life. The fifth book is called Bunny Cool, so let's start with that. Uh, we have a story about Bob and his family going on a camping trip that Bob didn't want to go on. Uh, his wife forced, forces him to sign the family up for activities and the woman asks if he's going to sign up for the bunny call which is essentially a family prank that wakes them up early in the morning. Uh, Bob wants revenge on his family for bringing him to this camping trip so he signs up for it. The day passes and Bob realises how much he loves his family uh, and how big of a mistake it was to sign up for the bunny call. Uh, he tells himself that he will do whatever he can to stop the bunny, Ralpho, at 5 a.m. When the time comes, uh, Ralpho attempts breaking into the cabin and Bob hits him, making him bleed. Remember that. Just as Ralpho is halfway through the window, 6 a.m. strikes and the bunny retreats. Bob hugs his family, knowing that they are okay, but the weird twist to the story is that the counselor who was in charge of the bunny call overslept that morning, meaning that it wasn't on. This does lead me to believe that it was some kind of supernatural force, but the weird part about all of this is that blood was spilled from the suit. So I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's ah. And of course, speaking of weird, <laughs> there isn't really a word to describe how weird this story is. Uh, that's right, the next story is In the Flesh, uh, <laughs> which follows Matt, uh, who is creating a VR game called Springtrap's Revenge. In the game, you have to run through a maze to escape Springtrap, but the AI was created in Matt's anger from a failed marriage and many failed relationships. Playtesting the game, Matt always lost, so he tortured the Springtrap, only to find out that the next day, it's gone. Dun dun da! In the game data log, Springtrap had been cloning himself, so there's a clone of him, and then he kills himself. Or the old version of himself. The game became corrupted, and when Matt died in the game, he felt a sting in his chest. We then turn to this perspective of a hacker called Gene Jr., which is really hard to say, who grabbed a copy of uh, Springtrap's Revenge to find a lifeless Springtrap on the ground. This story is very weird. It turns out that he had been extracted from the game by a program called itsaboy.exe. You can see where this is going. Matt's stomach becomes extremely bloated and he starts feeling very ill, so he decides to cut open his chest with a kitchen knife to birth a mini spring trap that people call fetus trap. Uh, he strokes Matt's cheek and says, Daddy. I, I, I personally really love this story, uh, so I, I made a mini, <laughs> a mini movie out of it. Anyway, speaking of movies, this is this next one is a story that I really want to see in theatres. This is the one and only The Man in Room 1280. In this one, a priest called Arthur is called to Heracles Hospital as there is a man in, you guessed it, 
room 1280. This man has exposed organs, burn marks on his skin and no facial features. Apparently he was taken off of life support but something inside him is keeping him alive. Yes my friends, I'm pretty sure this is a, at least a parallel to William Afton himself and Ultimate Custom Night. There's two souls fighting for control and Arthur finds out that he wants to go to the Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center. Arthur tries to take him there but the nurses refuse. They also try to kill him but it backfires and a shadowy boy with curly hair, curly hair, uh, and an alligator mask, alligator mask, appears. Arthur eventually gets permission and takes him to the distribution centre where the man baths a tar-like substance and explodes into black blood. When Arthur is asked if everything is okay, I love this addition to the story, he says that for the first time he believes that it is not. And I believe that this is probably the beginning of the Fazbear Frights timeline, which is going to be a whole other video. And that's funny cool. Uh, three stories about darkness, I would say, uh, which leads straight into the sixth book called Blackbird. I would like to say, if you're watching this video all the way through, tell me in the comments because I really appreciate that. I don't know how you're sitting through all of this with, uh, with, with so much to go, but uh, I hope that you're enjoying, at least. <laughs> you're making notes, you're writing this all down on a piece of paper. <laughs> Let's move into Blackbird, uh, which is about Noel and Sam who have to create a short horror film in class. The plot that they came up with is where a person confesses their deepest secret to the blackbird and it punishes them for it. Uh, which is actually based on The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. So Sam creates a blackbird costume while Noel confesses his darkest secret. He was a bully to a poor girl in high school. Sam gets angry at him as he has always been the victim of bullying and Noel seemed proud of what he'd done. Later, Noel finds out that Sam had been run over by a train in the costume, uh, and he has nightmares where the blackbird watches him from the corner of his corner. <laughs> this is a meme now on my channel. This this has to be a meme. Yeah, the blackbird watches him from the corner of his room in his, night in his nightmares. Noel runs to the middle of the campus, yelling how sorry he is, and realizes that he needs to apologize to the girl that he bullied. He finds her home and apologises to which she forgives him and tells him how much of a stronger person she is because of it. After all of that it's revealed that Sam is okay and he only has a broken leg. It's also revealed that Sam was once a bully as well so basically nothing that happened in this story actually ever mattered. Now, I, I'm not one to hate on this story. Uh, after all, I think it could be a parallel to Nightmare in FNAF 4, but we'll have to save that for another video. Now, this next story I might actually have a really difficult time telling because I absolutely love it. I love it so much, uh, but it's so emotional. The real Jake is about Jake, who we see a lot more of in the epilogues. So Jake has a brain tumour, Wink wink. So he spends most of his time in bed under the company of a family friend, Margie, as Jake's father, Evan, is in the military overseas. Every night, Jake talks to Simon, who lives in his closet, uh, and he asks what Jake has done that day, and Jake always responds with dull answers and what he actually did, uh, which leads Simon to ask what the real Jake did. Jake tells him things that he wishes that he did that day, though he cannot see Simon until he is able to walk properly. One day Jake's friend comes by, asking him to go to the arcade with him, so he tries sneakily climbing out of the window, only to collapse and vomit. Margie takes good care of him, and then it is revealed that Simon is a doll with a baby monitor that she made so that Jake's father could talk to him. When Jake falls asleep, Margie adds elements to the doll so that it looks like Jake's idea of the real Jake uh, as a surprise for when he gets better. Another day, Margie receives a phone call from Jake's uncle, Michael, uh, telling her that Evan had been killed in an accident uh, and this meant that Simon no longer had a voice. So Margie tried to make up excuses for Simon not talking to Jake that night uh, and in the morning, Jake's, 
Jake looks worse than ever. Uh, I have chills. My hairs are stood up. And Margie leaves the house uh, for the ambulance, only to come back to Jake, who had passed away at that very moment. Uh, the story ends by informing us that nobody had seen Simon's closet wide open, which implies that Jake most likely possessed the doll, which is how he got into the stitch race. Best story ever. That's all I can say for this one. Okay, moving on from the emotions uh, and on to hide and seek. The story is about Toby who can't beat his bully older brother in any arcade games, so he decides to get a win in a new attraction, which is called Hide and Seek. The game is a room where the player is a seeker who has to find the hiding shadow bonnie cutout. Toby confidently plays the game, but he can't find the bonnie anywhere. In rage, he destroys the game and runs home to a nightmare where he is pinned to a table with his back being sewn open. The next day, Toby has a different shadow with bunny ears and sharp teeth. And he tries to drown it so that it would get rid of him, but instead he almost drowns himself. He has an emotional talk with his brother and the shadow slightly fades, showing that it's fueled by Toby's anger. When Toby goes back to the arcade, he realizes that the game was still going on and that he could forfeit the game to get rid of the shadow. Stupidly, he decides to play <laughs> and completes the game by slamming himself into one of the props and killing himself. Only pro gamers would sacrifice their lives together. Number one victory royale! So there we go. That was book number six with stories about being haunted by past events. Let's move on to The Cliffs, which involves a single father, Robert, who looks after his two-year-old son, Tyler. Uh, Robert is upset as he doesn't think that he is good enough for Tyler, which is kind of bad knowing that they live next to a cliff that is famous for mass amounts of suicides. They go shopping one day and Robert buys Tyler a tag-along Freddy that sends Robert updates about Tyler when he isn't watching him. One day Tyler is playing in the sandbox when Robert receives a phone call inside. When Robert comes back, Tyler is gone uh, and Freddy just tells Robert, gone. <laughs> he calls the police to find him, but he keeps receiving texts from Freddy telling him to go to the cliffs. <laughs> this angers him, causing him to destroy the toy which is still able to send him messages about the cliffs. Robert then goes to the cliffs and when he's at the top, he realises that none of his family would ever want him to jump. He throws Freddy off of the cliff and hears screaming from below. Robert makes his way down and finds Tyler in a small cave who apparently went chasing a dog. And that's basically the story. It's quite a sweet story uh, and I'm glad that it didn't actually end in a suicide. Uh, that would have been very fnaf but very terrible. Speaking of terrible, this next story isn't terribly written, but the events of it are just... Wow. The Breaking Wheel, a story about Reed who gets bullied by Julius in robotics class. For school they have to make a robot for a project and Julius builds an impressive exoskeleton that can be controlled remotely and by a person climbing inside. A bit like spring lock seats. Reed's friend Pickle, yeah, Pickle, <laughs> builds a remote control robot, but the ro the remote's frequency uh, also controls Julius's exoskeleton. Reed is done with Julius bullying everyone, so he stays after school to confront him, uh, but where Julius threatens to lock Reed in the suit and control him like a slave. But the locks falter and Julius gets trapped inside instead. Reed decides to keep him there for the night to teach him a lesson. And on the way home, Reed and his friends talk about the breaking wheel, which was a device used to crush victims' bones. Uh, Reed becomes scared that he trapped Julius in something that was similar to the breaking wheel. As Pickle controls the robot inside, Reed can hear banging outside that corresponds to the remote. Everyone else thinks that it's the wind, but Reed sees as the exoskeleton breaks into the house with Julius's mutilated body attached to it. <laughs> Julius chases Reed around the house until he grabs him around the throat, 
uh, and kills him. Reed's friends, unaware of what happened, smash all of the buttons on the remote, causing the robot to self-destruct. So yeah, that happened. Speaking of, yeah, that happened. I think it's time for He Told Me Everything. Every year, Dr. Little hosts a life-changing after-school experiment and Chris wants to join in to become popular. This year, the experiment uses Fazgu. F Fazgu. <laughs> You thought I was going to say corner. And Fazgu is from the Freddy Fazbear Mad Scientist kit and it is a sticky pink sub substance. The students have to take out one of their teeth and put it in the Fazgu along with their index finger so it could feed off of the blood cells. However, Chris doesn't want to take out one of his teeth, so instead he uses a baby tooth that he kept uh, when it fell out as a child. As he used an older tooth, the experiment took much longer for Chris as every child left, telling Dr. Little he or she told me everything, Chris was still going through the process until he was the only one left in school. He took naps and when he woke up, there was a goo monster on the table next to him uh, and it was on the end of his finger and it resembled him. They looked the same and they had the same heartbeat. Chris tried to cut the tendril between the fingers but he couldn't as the goo was draining his energy. As he realises that the goo was taking his life and cloning him, he told the monster to be good to his friends and family, something that he should have done before. Chris melts and the duplicate hands a bag of his remains to Dr. Little, saying he told me everything. Now I can see why people get mad at this story. They took the word goo, put faz in front of it, and suddenly it's a FNAF story. <laughs> I, th I think it's quite funny though. So there you go, that was book number seven, containing stories about learning things the hard way. Book number eight is called Gumdrop Angel, and yes, we are almost there. Uh, Angel is at Freddy Fazbear's for her stepsister's birthday party, and she meets an assistant manager called Dominic, who she finds cute. As the party ends, a birthday gummy is dropped from the ceiling, which is a life-sized girl made out of candy. Children can eat the candy, but the gumdrop nose is for Ophelia. Angel gets a little mad because uh, her stepdad bought her ponies and expensive lessons, but stops her from calling Dominic and won't, play and won't pay for her college tuition. Out of anger, Angel steals Ophelia's gumdrop nose and eats it, tormenting Ophelia over how delicious it was. Later, she wakes up to find her body itchy and her skin red. She showers and tries to get it off, but the rash continues to grow and become scaly. You can see where this is going. She then realizes that her face is like a wet gumdrop and that this all happened from Freddy's. Angel calls Dominic asking what he did to her, to which he tells her she needs to get to Freddy's as soon as possible. When she gets there, the rash has become much, much worse and Dominic leads her to the back room with a box. She enters the box and hears Dominic crying as she loses consciousness. When she wakes up, she is lowered as she hears children cheering. She is the new birthday gummy and all she can do is sit there while she gets eaten alive. Wow, did you, get, did you just get the chills too? I got the chills. I love the addition of Dominic crying in this story as, as she falls asleep. Uh, it, it makes it 10 times more powerful than it otherwise would be. Anyway, moving on to another story that may give you a different type of chills. Sergio's lucky day is, uh, is well, about Sergio, uh, who's actually upset about becoming project manager at work. And he's upset about his relationship as he actually still likes a girl from high school 10 years ago. His life starts to become really unlucky as it rains. His car breaks down and he makes his way to a gas station where he finds a toy in a garbage can. This toy is a balloon boy holding a sign saying, I'm a lucky boy. When Sergio buys a lottery ticket, he wins $600,000 uh, and asks the toy what he should do with the money, to which he responds, Spend it. He spends the money on expensive things and doesn't buy anything for his girlfriend, causing a fallout. Basically, this dude is a scumbag. <laughs> Lucky Boy continues to tell him what to do in his life and Sergio continues to listen, no matter what. He's attending a high school reunion and wants to impress 
his high school crush, so asks Lucky Boy how he can become more attractive. He tells Sergio to cut off his ears, his eyelids, his hair, his nose and more, mutilating himself, basically. He gets to the party and everyone begins screaming as he leaves a trail of fleshy blood behind him. So yeah, that one definitely gave me a different type of chills. In fact, that was just describing my morning routine, so that it didn't really affect me. That story was fire, to be fair. Speaking of fire, <laughs> let's move on to what we found, uh, which actually takes place in Fazbear's Fright. Hudson is the new security guard and he's had a pretty terrible life. Uh, his, his father committed suicide and his stepfather beat him. Bullies flushed his head down the toilet and teachers said that he had no potential. Uh, however, a lot of people are scared of Hudson as he was the only one that survived a fire in his family home. A few weeks into his job, a spring trap with a human corpse inside gets moved into the location from an old Freddy's. Hudson touches the flesh on the spring trap and he starts to hallucinate all of the bad things that have happened throughout his life. His head gets slammed into an arcade machine as he hallucinates being beaten up by his stepdad. He sees that the spring trap has moved and hallucinates being dragged to the toilet by the school bullies. As he picks up a hammer and a knife to protect himself, animatronic mouths calling him stupid crawl up his body and try to get into his mouth. Uh, it's a bit like room for one more. He drops to the floor crying and wets himself. He gets attacked and bitten by spring trap but it was all an illusion. He gets thrown across the lobby and taunted by hallucinations. Then he hides in an oven but gets locked in. The oven gets turned on from the outside and at that moment he realises that it was him all along that set his own house on fire and killed his family. What a twist! As he comes to the realisation, he burns to death and the next morning his worker friends come down to the smell of burning but everything is in the same place as it was when they left it the previous night. This story is fantastic because it's exactly what we all wanted. A story closely related to one of the original games. Anyway, that was book number 8, which was an extremely strong book uh, and one containing stories about bad luck and misfortune. Now let's move on to the final book for this video. Uh, there are going to be two more books after this, but at the moment we're only up to this book. So let's quickly cover the puppet carver. The puppet carver is all about Jack, who is a horrible boss of a pizzeria and a horrible person to everyone in his life. His business isn't doing very well, so one of his workers, Porter, shows off a machine called the puppet carver, which creates animatronic out of wood for a very low cost. It malfunctions and Jack fires all of his workers in rage. Later that night, uh, Jack hears something coming from the machine, so he goes inside to see what's wrong. The door locks behind him and buzz saws approach his body. The story gets weird here. Uh, I must tell you that Jack manages to escape the machine just in time, but it's wildly, th wildly, widely theorised that he actually died in this machine and was replaced by something else. It will become quite obvious what he was replaced by soon. We think this because when he uh, when he leaves the machine he has a completely different outlook on life. Uh, he goes to do nice things to all different kinds of people but then gets cornered <laughs> by a hallucination of a monster made of fazgu and human organs. The monster reaches out to him uh, and he suddenly feels all of the pain that he's ever dealt to anyone in his life before it disappears. He apologises to his workers and rehires them, leading to Porter making a completely new machine, uh, and a better version of the puppet carver, while another worker looks in the trash compartment of the old one and finds Fazgu and human remains. I think it's implied in this story that Jack was replaced much like the kids in He Told Me Everything, and that the duplicate version is much more appreciative of life. And while we're on the topic of appreciating life, let's ju j jump to the next story. J j that's right, the penultimate story is called Jumper Tickets. This video has gotten worse and worse by the story. <laughs> yeah, the penultimate story is called Jumper Tickets, which follows Colton, who goes to the arcade at Freddy's every week to try to win an expensive games console. 
Colton meets his little cousin Aiden, who he despises, and he brings him to the Jump for Tickets game hosted by Coils the Clown. The kids have to jump up and down on the ticket pulverizer, causing tickets to fall from the ceiling, but Colton realises that the game gives more tickets to small children, so he hopes to change the game uh, to give him more tickets. One night he sneaks into Freddy's and tries to repair the machine, but it actually makes it a lot worse for him. Instead, he decides another night to sneak in just before the opening, but when he's inside, he realises that Coils the Clown is following him. As Colton tries to enter the machine, Coils tries to pull him out, but it doesn't work. Uh, he gets trapped inside the machine underneath the ticket pulverizer, and when the arcade opens, the kids start to play the game, squishing Coils... Coils? Squishing Colton to his death. <laughs> When the manager finds out that the platform doesn't go as far down as normal, he puts an out of order sign on the game and Aiden comes over to Coils, telling him that he was actually saving his tickets up for Colton to buy the console. Coils turns from a happy clown to a sad clown with a teardrop and hugs Aiden. I think it's very possible here that Colton possessed Coils uh, at the end there, but damn, that was a gruesome story. But we all know that the final story I have to cover here is far from gruesome. It is 10 times worse. Pizza Kit, a story about Peyton and Marley on a school trip to the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Kit factory. Peyton is very introverted and Marley is quite the opposite, which is why she gets bored on the field trip and brings Peyton to a high platform above all the vats of pizza sauce. Marley leans on the railing and falls off into the smoke below and Peyton doesn't know what to do. She doesn't tell anybody about Marley when they ask where she is and she starts to worry a lot. That night she gets a nightmare about Freddy Fazbear taking Marley's severed screaming head and putting it into the pizza sauce. This is already terrible. At school the pizzas have been delivered and when Peyton receives hers, the dough seems fleshy, the sauce seems bloody and the pepperoni feels like a tongue. She tries to eat it but feels very sick after the first slice. When she gets home, she has another nightmare where Marley's hand rises at the back of her throat, trying to escape her stomach. Fleshy, bloody liquid starts to pour from her mouth, from her nostrils and her ears, and her eyeballs pop out of her sockets to make room for Marley's new body. By the way, when I first read all of this, I didn't know it was a nightmare, <laughs> so I was a bit confused, but uh, I, I get it now, I understand it. Peyton starts to hear rustling in the bush outside and thinks that it is Marley. The doorbell rings and she is terrified that Marley is angry at her for not saying anything to anybody. Uh, therefore Peyton climbs onto the roof to hide, but falls off. The last scene in the story is Marley at the door, completely fine after pranking Peyton, her school and her family, hearing something at the side of the house. She looks around the corner and Peyton's corpse is lying on the ground with a snapped neck and a twisted head. Marley screams and that's it. Boys, we did it. <laughs> if you watch this entire video all the way through, then wow, I have to, I have to applaud you. This was so much fun to make and to look back at all the stories this series has given us, it's been, it's been thrilling. I hope that you took some notes from this <laughs> uh, or got refreshed on what all these stories were about. I cannot wait for the final two or three books uh, to make sure that you subscribe for when I make audiobooks and summaries on those. But for now, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in another video. Goodbye.